How are you? I am doing well. Um, so we have several of our attendees who have logged in, uh, but it is only just now 10 o'clock, so I guess we'll give it a couple of minutes before we officially get started. Everybody figured out how to use Zoom, and or is this your first attempt? <laughs> uh, no, we've been using Zoom for the past couple of months, actually. So, although I, I will say that I do feel a little bit like a <laughs> like expert level at this point. So, <laughs> I just thought if we should get Zoom at Unchained, do you recommend it? I think it's a pretty good platform. Yeah, it does a lot of things. Um, there are different packages depending on how many people you think you might want to have, but yeah, overall I've been pretty happy with it, so. Do you know which package you have? I want to say we have the professional package. Yeah, which is the lowest level above the free. Um, it's like free business and then pro, I think. Oh, I thought it was free, then pro, and then something else. But, so you have two levels up? I think so. Okay. Yeah, there are some interesting features <laughs> I could tell you about with like branding and such, so. And do you all have your own users or are you the only user? Um, at the package we have, we can have up to like, I want to say nine users, I think, so. Okay. Oh, yes, yeah, so you do have a fancier version. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we had to upgrade <laughs> when all <laughs> started, so. All right. So people are continuing to join in, I can see. So we'll go ahead and get started in about, let's say, two minutes. Just give everyone time to, uh, to log in. Um, so for all of the participants for this morning, your mics are automatically muted and um, there's no video. Uh, so it will be a conversation between myself and Frady, and then we will take questions um, towards the end of the webinar. Um, which can be done by uh, submitting a question through the Q&A button, which is located um, sort of on the bottom bar of the screen. All right, so I guess we'll, it's, it's two minutes after 10, so we'll just go ahead um, with the intro, um, and then Freddie, we can get to the conversation. Um, so good morning, and thank you to everyone for joining us for Impact Tuesdays, uh, JWF's webinar series featuring a um, special conversation and Q&A with a JWF grantee. I am Jennifer Krishka, CEO of the Jewish Women's Foundation of the Greater Palm Beaches, a nonprofit dedicated to creating and supporting feminist social change in the United States and in Israel. We provide grants to innovative organizations aligned with our mission, uh, educational opportunities for the community to learn about the most critical issues facing women and girls, and leadership training programs to develop the next generation of feminist leaders. For more information about JWF, please visit us online at jwfpalmbeach.org. Uh, so today we are joined by Frady Rice, she is the founder and executive director of Unchained at Last, which is based in New Jersey, but works um, throughout the United States and I think even beyond that. Um, so we are going to start, and Frady, thank you so much for joining us virtually this morning. Um, it's so nice to see you. <laughs> it is great to see you. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to have this conversation and for all of JWF's support to Unchained at Last over the last several years. Of course. So first and foremost, I hope that you're healthy and doing well and that your family is, is healthy and doing well. Yes, the basics right now, right? Yes, thank, yes, thankfully that's where we're all doing well and I hope the same for all of you. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, probably uh, not everyone is familiar um, with the organization, so I thought we could start just by having you tell us um, a little bit about the background, the history of how it, how it began, um, and sort of like what the core mission is for you. Sure, so I found it on Chain at last out of my own traumatic experience. I myself am a forced marriage survivor. I grew up in a very insular religious community in New York City where that is just the norm. Your parents arrange a marriage for you when you're young and you have very little say in the matter. And in my case, the marriage that my family arranged for me to a stranger was uh, an abusive marriage. The stranger turned out to be abusive from the first week of the marriage. But because of religious laws and social customs that made it very difficult for me to leave, I was trapped 
in that abusive marriage for 15 years. And when I finally escaped my family, they still consider me dead. In fact, they were, uh, one of my sisters who kept in touch at first told me my family was planning to sit shiva for me to go through the, the Jewish mourning ritual for me as if I had literally died, which until today, I don't know if they've done more than a decade later, they still consider me dead and won't talk to me. Um, but I, after I managed to rebuild my life with my two daughters, I founded Unchained at Last, which was at the time and remains the only organization that is dedicated to ending forced and child marriage in the United States. And we do that through both direct services. We provide really crucial, often life-saving services to people in the United States or from the United States who are either in a forced marriage and trying to get out or are facing one. Their, plan their parents are planning a wedding for them that they don't want and, uh, and you help escaping from that. Really crucial wraparound life-saving services, everything from helping them to escape to getting them to someplace safe providing free legal representation for divorce and other legal matters and helping them rebuild their life with everything from helping them get into college to starting their own business to ongoing emotional support, psychotherapy, never charge for any of our services. And then at the same time, we are looking to end these horrific human rights abuses in the United States. And our current focus right now on the advocacy side is passing legislation that when we first started doing this in 2015, uh, the laws in the United States allowed child marriage or marriage before 18 in all 50 states. And thanks to JWF support, we start we launched this uh, this movement, which now become a national movement to end child marriage in the U.S. And thanks to all of you, we have been able to change the laws so far in New Jersey and Delaware, and in uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. And um, an American Samoa, which did it on its own, they just followed our lead, we weren't even involved in that, just one day when nobody was looking. American Samoa ended child marriage, and we are now looking to do the same in another 48 states, three territories, and one district. That's amazing. Um, so I know that often when I tell people about child marriage that um, almost always I'm met by a response of surprise that people can't believe that um, in 2020 in the United States that that is actually um, something that exists. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the laws and kind of how it works in different states? And I know that in some states um, there's uh, parental consent or a judge can consent to a marriage if, you know, uh, the person, the child really is under a certain age. So how, how exactly does that work? Yeah, so first, you're absolutely right. We're trying to solve a problem that most Americans don't even know exists. People think child marriage, they know it's happening in other parts of the world, developing countries. There's very, very little awareness of the fact that this is a, such a significant problem right here in the U.S. And one of our big challenges is raising awareness and, and, and creating consciousness of this problem. And just before I answer your question, to explain how widespread this problem is, when we first started doing this in 2015, not only did nobody know that this was happening and it was legal in all 50 states, but nobody knew the full extent of it. Nobody knew how often it was happening. And we changed that. We did groundbreaking research where we retrieved marriage license data from all 50 states and discovered that between 2000 and 2010, an estimated 248,000 children were married in the U.S. Almost all of them were girls married to adult men, by the way. So this is very much a girls and women's issue. But, but to answer your question about how the laws work, so when we first started doing this, the laws in almost every state did set 18 as the marriage age. And 18 is the age of adulthood in almost every state. It's either 18 or higher in every U.S. state. However, there are these dangerous loopholes in every state law that allowed marriage before the age of 18. And when we first started doing this, the loopholes in more than half of the U.S. were so gaping that they allowed marriage at any age. The effective marriage age in most of the United States was zero, which, by the way, put those states' laws in lines with laws at the time in Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen. So just to give you a, a, a sense of how serious this was. Um, and now these loopholes remain in 48 states. And the typical loopholes are... Um, in, in most U.S. states, children can marry often at like 16 or 17, which legislators somehow think is almost 18, so that's somehow okay. Um, children can marry if they have parental consent. 
Now, I say consent, I always use the air quotes with consent because when a child is forced to marry, what we have seen at Unchained at last is that the perpetrators are almost always the parents. So parental consent is often parental coercion. Mm. And this, this signature on a form does nothing to protect a child from being forced into marriage. In fact, I've, I've worked with survivors who showed up at the clerk's office sobbing openly while their parents signed the form and the clerk either didn't look up or in one um, horrific case, there was a survivor who testified at a legislative hearing that the clerk said to her, oh, why are you crying, honey? This should be the happiest day of your life. Mm -hmm. When she was being married off to, um, to an, a, a man who had been raping her and was gonna be sent home to live with her rapist. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another very common loophole that exists in a lot of the United States is judicial approval. Often under the age that's set for parental consent, which is often 16, children can marry even younger if a judge also approves it. And you would think, well, if a judge approves it, it has to be okay. The problem with judicial approval is that these children are too scared to tell the judge what's actually going on. Of all the survivors I have worked with who went in front of a judge as part of the process of being forced into a marriage, mm -hmm. not a single one was honest with the judge. They all lied to the judge. So all the judicial approval process does is create additional trauma for a child who's already in a very traumatic situation. Mm -hmm. And so these children who were being married off, um, where do they come from? And how do people get to you? How do they find you? Well, the data that we retrieved from across the U.S. did not have identifying information about the children. It was age of bride, age of groom, year they were married. So from the data, we don't know where they come from. We do know anecdotally, though, from the survivors and, um, and those who are you know, even currently going through the situation who reach out to us to ask for help or to see how they can help. We know that this is happening in every community and culture and religion, every socioeconomic level, families that have been in the U.S. for many generations, as well as immigrant families from communities of origin on every inhabited continent. So really the, the commonality that we see is that it's almost always girls and that the perpetrators are almost always their parents. Mm -hmm. And they reach out to us mostly through word of mouth and we get a lot of media the attention. So you know, we're a tiny little organization. There are five of us. Our budget is half a million dollars a year. We work out of a tiny office in New Jersey when we're allowed to leave the house. Right now we're, <laughs> we're working from, from tiny home offices right. in three different states. But um, we we'll hear about us from word of mouth, uh, doing a Google search, uh, and a lot of referrals. We get referrals from domestic violence agencies, the U.S. State Department, which we partner with often to help those who are taken overseas for a forced marriage, law enforcement, um, but a lot of it is people call and say, you help my sister, can you help me? Hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so can you talk about, um, I guess, some of the negative consequences or the negative life outcomes for, um, let's say, girls who are, you know, married before they're the age of 18? So I know that there's been pushback. And if someone's, let's say, 17-year-old, they're saying, you know, what, what's the big deal if someone's 17 or 16 um, getting married? Yeah, and we get that a lot, especially, you know, uh, legislators say, what's the big deal about a girl getting married at 17? Is she, maybe she's really mature, she's in love, she wants to get married, especially if she's pregnant, she should get married. Mm -hmm. And so what we always explain is that there are two main reasons to end all marriage before the age of 18, no exceptions, not even for somebody who's turning 18 tomorrow. And the first really important reason is that even a day before your 18th birthday here in the United States, you do, you do not have full legal rights. You have limited legal rights. And with those limited legal rights, it is so easy for you to be forced into a marriage or to be forced to stay in a marriage. And that changes the day you turn 18. It has nothing to do with maturity. It's about legal capacity. Before you turn 18, in most states, if you run away, you can be taken into police custody or dragged back home against your will because you're a runaway. You don't have the right to open your front door and leave home to escape from parents who are planning an unwanted wedding for you or to escape from an abusive spouse. If you try to get to a domestic violence shelter without being taken into police custody, the domestic violence shelter probably will turn you away. We have found that domestic violence shelters across the US routinely turn away, I shouldn't say routinely, because it's not that common that somebody even, man a child even manages to get to a shelter, but those that do, the shelters typically turn them away because there are all kinds of legal liability issues that come with taking in a child who's not there with the parents. And then it gets worse and worse. 
retaining an attorney becomes nearly impossible because contracts with children, including retainer agreements, are avoidable typically or void before the age of before the age of eighteen. You can't enter into a, um, a binding contract, and therefore no attorney wants to represent these children. We've had girls call and say, "I tried every attorney in my state. Nobody will take me on as a client." And then perhaps most shockingly, children typically are not allowed to bring a legal action in their own name before they turn eighteen which means in many states, not only can they not seek a protective order against a, uh, an abusive spouse, but in many states, they're not even allowed to file for divorce. So they can be entered into the marriage by their parent and or a judge, but they don't have the legal right to leave that marriage. So we're just completely disempowering children and creating a trap for them. We like to say it puts the lock in wedlock. And then the second really important reason to end marriage before 18, which you just alluded to, is the devastating lifelong repercussions. We have, there's been research done on what happens to a girl or a woman in the US, not in a developing country, right here in the US, in Florida, in New Jersey, in California, what happens to a girl or a woman who marries before 18? And here's what happens. And actually, the studies, many of them looked at what happens if a girl marries at or before 18, so really before 19. So um, it means that she's 50% more likely to drop out of high school, four times less likely ever for the rest of her life to finish college. She's three times more likely to have five or more children. And then you can understand why that means she's also 31% more likely to end up living in poverty in adulthood. And then because of the forfeited education and the poverty and the stress that come with child marriage, she also faces a 23% increased risk of serious health conditions, including heart attack, cancer, diabetes, and stroke, and an increased risk of almost every psychiatric disorder. And then there was also a global study that showed that women who marry before 18 are three times more likely to experience domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So we are putting girls in the U.S. in a situation where they're three times more likely to be beaten by their husband, but not allowed to leave home, get into a domestic violence shelter, hire an attorney, file for divorce, get a protective order. That's amazing. So with all of these reasons um, for child marriage to not exist or to argue um, you know, to raise the minimum age to 18 in each state. Obviously, you haven't been able to pass legislation in all of the states that you're lobbying in. So I guess, like, what's the argument coming from the other side? So, you know, we at Unchain, we created a hashtag called vomitocious excuses. And we, we tweet about this a lot, the vomitocious excuses that legislators use to cling to child marriage. And what it comes down to is one thing. It is misogyny. It is a lot of mostly male legislators, um, even though we've gotten pushback from female legislators also, but most legislators in the U.S. are male. We're talking about a very much girls and women's issue. And so the number one pushback we get is girl gets pregnant. She's got to get married even if she was raped. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the problem with that argument. And we point this out because there's all kinds of data that shows that a pregnant teenage girl, who by the way, the number one reason that we see at Unchained at last that a girl is forced to marry is because of a pregnancy. These are the girls who need the most protection. And the problem with marrying off a pregnant teenage girl is A, in many cases, unfortunately, that's used to cover up rape and to force a girl to marry her own rapist. And in fact, in Florida, you're, you know, the face of this is a Florida resident, Sherry Johnson. And she, she came with, with us when we were um, advocating to change the law in Florida, where unfortunately we failed to end child marriage. They did pass a law making the marriage age 17, but they didn't make it 18. 17 is still a child. And her in her situation, Sherry Johnson, she was uh, raped when she was nine, and she got pregnant, gave birth at 10, and at 11, when she was 11, her mother forced her to marry her adult rapist. He was a 20-year-old deacon at the church because she didn't want the deacon of the church to go to prison for rape. Mm. So unfortunately, this has been used to cover up rape. And if a girl gets pregnant before the age of consent to have sex, the only way that could have happened is if she was raped. Why are we handing out marriage licenses? But beyond that also, even if a girl is above the age of consent to have sex and this was not the result of the rape, the problem with marrying off a pregnant teenage girl is studies show that as devastating as the consequences are for any girl or woman who marries before the age of 18 in the US, it's even worse for a pregnant teenage girl. She's actually more likely to suffer economic deprivation and instability if she marries as a pregnant teenage girl than if a pregnant teenage girl states, well, we're not doing her or the baby any favors by marrying her off. Mm. So the first thing that comes to mind for me, I guess, when I hear this is, 
um, I have to ask the question about abortion, which is, you know, in, based on your experience and what you've seen, do you think that often the case is um, legislators, parents, whomever would rather see their child married off who's pregnant um, because they think that it will then mean um, it will reduce the likeliness that that girl will then get an abortion. Well, that's that's an argument that I have heard. I don't know if it's the you know top one, but yes, I have heard that. And in fact, in New Jersey, New Jersey Right to Life, which is uh, an anti-choice group, um, came out strongly against the legislation to end child marriage because they said, well, ending child marriage is going to increase teenage abortion rates because if girls get pregnant and they can't get married, instead they're going to have abortions. Mm. And what I replied is, that is based purely on conjecture. I don't know any study that has ever shown that ending child marriage increases abortion rates. And in fact, we can't study that because the first two US states to end child marriage just did so two years ago. So when, when they were arguing this, no US state had ended child marriage. So there was no study that showed how it impacted abortion rates. But if we're just guessing, which is what they were doing, I said, my guess, is that ending child marriage will decrease teenage pregnancy rate. And that's something everybody can get behind. Sure, sure. Okay, so for anyone who maybe joined us late, I just saw a question came up. Um, so Frady Rice is the founder and executive director of Unchained at Last, which is a, a national organization that's based in New Jersey um, that JWF has been funding for um, the last several years, uh, I would Thank say. You. <laughs> um, and we will take questions towards the end of the panel, um, which can be submitted uh, by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. Um, so Freddy, so can you just like talk us through like what the process is like um, with you trying to lobby to change legislation in any particular state? So I know, so you were here in Florida a couple of years ago. Um, so maybe we can, you know, start there and kind of tell us like what that process was like. Well, um, process in Florida, like a lot of other things in Florida, was was fraught <laughs> and complicated. Um, so, which, you know, the process that we engage in, in in every state where we introduce legislation, and by the way, keep in mind at this point, you know, when we first started, I introduced, I wrote the bill in New Jersey to end child marriage, because that's my home state. So I started there, found a legislator who was willing to introduce the bill, I had to shop around for a while, believe me, till I did that. Actually, I had to get two legislators, one in the Senate, one in the Assembly, and um, and then just rammed it through, just pushed really hard, met with, there were 120 legislators in New Jersey, and at the time, I was, we were a team of one, I was the only one, so I met with, or at least called, all 120 legislators, and which is why the bill passed, uh, it started out with no support at all, and then it ended up passing with only five out of 120 no votes. Of course, the first time it passed, Governor, then Governor Christie vetoed it, and I had to do the same thing again the following year, and it passed, and Governor Murphy signed it. Hmm. But um, after, you know, once New Jersey did it, and then after, when we had to reintroduce it, by then Delaware, which had a shorter legislative session, had introduced, a, a legislator there introduced the bill, and there it passed, and that Delaware became the first state to end child marriage. Once that happened, other states started following our lead, and we didn't call legislators in Florida and in a lot of the other states that have introduced legislation to say, can you introduce it? The legislators there introduced it and then called me and said, hey, I just introduced a bill or I'm about to introduce a bill, I need your help. And so that's what happened in Florida. And I said, great, you know, thank you so much. I wish you would have waited because I'm a little busy right now, but sure, I'll come down to Florida and do what I can <laughs> to convince every single legislator. And I don't remember now, it's been a couple of years. Do you, do you know how many legislators there are in Florida? <laughs> I probably should, but I can, honestly can't say offhand how many we have. I mean, it's, you, in, in any given state, it's usually, uh, you know, around a couple hundred. So, it, you know, this is not an easy process. So in every state, we also put together a coalition. And in Florida, we had a wonderful coalition. And, and JWF was a member of that coalition. And then we had also other groups from across Florida, as well as national groups mm -hmm. like, um, like the AHA Foundation, and, um, and then we also had even international groups that we've recruited to this, like Human Rights Watch was involved in, the, in trying to pass the legislation in Florida. And um, I, don't, I don't remember, if, um, I think UNICEF, USA, and Sons International ended up joining later. So I don't know if they were involved in the Florida effort. Mm -hmm. But 
but Human Rights Watch and uh, representatives of Human Rights Watch and I and members of several of the different groups in Florida, as well as Sherry Johnson, the survivor I mentioned before, we planned uh, different you know, advocacy days where we just had, you know, we, I would go down to Florida for a week and we would just spend a week going back to back meetings, meeting with legislators and urging their support. Things took a turn for the worse when our lead sponsor, and this is something that, again, I've, I've worked in many, many, many states, and Florida is the only state where this has happened. Our <laughs> lead sponsor was arrested, um, mostly as far as I could tell for being a Democrat. Um, so she, you know, the Republicans decided that she wasn't actually living. It was Daisy Baez. I don't know if you remember this story, but they decided she wasn't living in the district where she had run because she had two homes and they, she lived more in the other one. So they literally just let her out in handcuffs one day. And we thought, oh, that's, that's not a good sign for the bill. And then there were Republicans who took over and immediately said, well, 18 is too high an age for marriage. No one should have to wait that long and made it 17 instead. And, um, and that's the bill that passed. Right, and prior to that, the age in Florida was 16? Zero. Oh, it was zero. Yeah, which is why Sherry Johnson was able to marry at 11 when she had been raped. Right, yeah. so it went from nothing to 17, which is certainly an improvement, um, but definitely not what we were hoping for. Certainly an improvement, but here's the problem, and this is why you know, legislators think they solve the problem when they make the marriage age 17. Almost all of the children who marry in Florida, marry in Florida are 17. Mm -hmm. So I keep telling legislators, you can't end a human rights abuse if you're failing to protect most of the individuals impacted by that human rights abuse. All you're doing is wasting paper. Go home. I mean, right. if you're going to carve out an exception for a group, carve out an exception for the seven-year-olds, because there are no seven-year-olds getting married. We right. have to... If we have to fail to protect an age group, don't make it to the 17 year olds. Right. So, I mean, and so when something like that happens, um, do you try to move on to another state where you feel like it will be easier for you to get a bright line bill passed, meaning that it will be able to pass to raise it to 18? Um, and have you, or would you consider revisiting a state that maybe has changed it, like in Florida to 17, but has not um, passed a bright line bill? Yeah, so, well, uh, so our policy now is, because there are so many states right now, there's that bright line legislation to end all marriage before 18 pending in 10 states. That's a lot of states for a team of five to handle. And remember, that team of five, we're also providing direct services. Um, you know, so, <laughs> you know, there's, that's a lot to handle. So what we do is we prioritize states where, um, you know, obviously those are only the bright line states. So we don't even count the states. There are other states that have what we call nonsense legislation pending that would make the marriage age 16 or 17. They're like, that's so cute. That's adorable, but that's nothing to do with us. The most we'll do for that is send a memo of opposition saying, why are you bothering? Mm -hmm. um, but of the 10 states where there is strong legislation pending, we, even there we have to prioritize and it's based on, you know, how, how how passionate is the legislative sponsor? Because if you have a legislative sponsor who doesn't really care about the bill and isn't gonna push it, it's less likely to pass. Um, you know, what kind of support are we getting on the ground? You know, how, do, what kind of chance do we have to actually pass this legislation? What kind of coalition can we build in that state? And so based on that, we have now of this 10 states, we are prioritizing Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Minnesota, and New Hampshire, just because those are the states where legislation has advanced, we have built support, we have a coalition, we think we can make this happen. Mm -hmm. If, uh, and remember, we didn't pick any of those states. All of those introduced legislation and, and called us up and said, huh, hey, hope you're not busy. We just introduced the bill you might want to come pass or help us pass. Mm -hmm. So um, if Florida introduced a new bill to make the marriage age 18 and we could build the same coalition we did last time, we're able to get down there, sure. I would love to revisit this in Florida and actually end child marriage as opposed to just taking credit for any child marriage, which is <laughs> what the Florida legislature has done to date. Sure. So how do you manage <laughs> with such a small team um, to do such amazing work? I mean, you've been uh, featured in a lot of different media. Um, I've heard you on NPR. Like you've been, I think, have done a really remarkable job in terms of um, marketing and PR for Unchained at Last. So, um, so how does your team manage? And you know, what is your, I guess, volunteer structure like? 
Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for your kind words. We do try hard. We're a tiny team, but we're so noisy. Uh, and, you know, it's been obviously really quiet and really tough to get any kind of legislation passed right now that's not related to coronavirus. So, the you know, the situation obviously has really, really um, kind of put a lot of our plans on hold. Sure. But, but normally we are noisy. We're just, we're just, we're five of us and we're so passionate. We really care. And we're the ones who see on a daily basis, the impact this is having on real lives. So for us, we can't not care. So we've we've invented, for example, a form of protest called a chain in, where we all we gather a bunch of people. We, we've had up to 50 people at our chain ins, and we all wear bridal gowns and veils. People donate their bridal gowns to us so we can do this. And then we chain our wrists and tape our mouths to show the world this is what life looks like for a girl or a woman who's forced to marry. She is trapped, she is silenced. Uh, I know we do a lot of media interviews. There are, there's a film that just came out, a documentary film that was in the in the uh, film festival circuit that unfortunately coronavirus has put uh, a halt to that. Um, but it's a film about forced and child marriage in the United States that features three survivors, and and I'm one of them. So you know we're just really creative in the the media in any kind of free marketing that we can use to you know when you do a chain in, you have 50 chain brides standing in front of the legislative building. That's going to be on the evening news. That's going to be on the front page of the newspaper. So that's how we just we build support, and uh, in terms of uh, and and aw raise awareness of this thing that just nobody seems to really know about. And most people, once they find out, do care and do want to join us. And in terms of our volunteer base, so every semester, and again, coronavirus has complicated this. But every semester, we have up to four interns who get college credit instead of payment, so that uh, they can. We train them to speak with legislators one-on-one -on -one, and they sit there calling or whenever we can, we can, we take them with us to our one-on-one -on -one meetings with legislators. And so that they, um, they try to reach, that, that's our, still our policies to reach every single legislator in every state where we introduce legislation to convince them of the importance of ending this human rights abuse that destroys girls' lives. And um, we also have hundreds of volunteers. We have about, uh, we have more than 600 actually active volunteers, most of them providing right. direct services to our clients, lawyers and psychotherapists, mm -hmm. but a lot of others. And, uh, and, and we're just really lucky to have, when we, when we put together a coalition, we have a nice group. When you should have seen the group that showed up when we were in Florida to speak with legislators. We had about 10 people there. Um, who, you know, people who had taken the day off of work to join us in Tallahassee. Um, I know, Jennifer, you had, you had wanted to be there, but something came up. You couldn't be there, I don't remember. Yes. <laughs> I know, yeah. unfortunately, I could not be there, but um, we were certainly proud of everything that the coalition had worked on and everything you did to try to push that bill. So, I mean, so since you mentioned it, I did, of course, want to ask about, you know, sort of how things are going now, like given the situation with the coronavirus, um, you know, how have you pivoted uh, to provide services for clients, um, you know, given the stay at home order and, and everything that's going on? So the pivoting to working from home for us was particularly easy just because we are all cloud based. We don't have any papers in our office and nothing on our desktops. It's all cloud based. And we, in fact, always worked from home once a week because I just, you know, liked that, you know, work. Um, work-life balance that that provided. So, so that part itself was simple. The problem that we're having is, uh, well, first of all, the, we know that rates of domestic violence increase during a crisis like this, and um, you know, domestic violence shelters are at capacity and getting people the escapes. One of the crucial services we provide is coordinating escapes. That's really, really complicated. It's hard to escape when your whole family is home the whole day, all the time. I mean, it's, it gets really hard to get out. And also we always had volunteers and others who could help survivors get from their home, you know, get outside at this time, walk around the corner, we'll pick you up, somebody will drive you here. It's hard to do that when nobody's allowed to leave the house. Sorry. Or we had somebody who knew that the shutdown was, you know, there was a, good, a lockdown coming in her state. So we're helping her get out early, but the, the person who was supposed to pick her up and drive her got sick that day and had to cancel. She got coronavirus. So, you know, the, that part of it, the logistics of getting people out of a dangerous situation and into someplace self has become much more complicated. 
but our interactions with our clients always was for the most part over the phone or over text message or over email. So that part hasn't changed much. And then on the advocacy side, obviously that's where we have seen the biggest um, setback where some states, uh, it has already happened, Wisconsin, they just, they just declared all the bills that were pending dead and they're just not going to consider them this legislative session. They just don't have the time. And we're going to see that in other states as well, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I know things are really challenging for everyone right now. And I'm glad at least that you know, you're know you safe and your team is able to do what they can. Um, so I'm sure like once things normalize, you'll be able to be out there lobbying as soon as you can, right? And, and doing your advocacy work. <laughs> That, that is the plan. For now, we're doing whatever we can to, to keep the team spirit and, and keep engaged. And so every day, every morning, we do a team huddle um, where we all, uh, we use Google T um, Hangouts team, which is a, a free platform. We're all about free. Anytime we can save a dollar, we'll do it. Um, although we might have to switch to Zoom because it doesn't always work quite as well. And I'm liking Zoom. This is a very good setup. Um, and then we also go for virtual team walks. So we're each in a different city and in three different states. But we once a day we go, we you know get on our phone and, and on video chat, we go for a walk through you know each of us in our own neighborhoods. Um, and then every Friday we also at one o'clock we have a virtual wine and chocolate celebration. You have to bring your own wine, or most of us don't even have wine and it's back at home can't buy any, so it becomes tea or orange juice or whatever you can find. And most of us have run out of chocolate, so it's, you know, grapes or, <laughs> or anything you can get your hands on. And then we just celebrate surviving the week and, um, and then close our home offices early because there's only so much we can do <laughs> before we lose our minds. No, of course. So I see that we had a couple questions that have come in. Um, so I will uh, go through them. So the first question that came in, um, so what percentage of child marriages in the United States are coming from Haredi communities? Uh, and what percentage are coming from mail order brides from abroad? So, you know, in terms of the actual data, the data that we retrieve from across the U.S. that show that 248,000 children were married between 2000 and 2010, that did not include identifying information about the children in terms of uh, their ethnicity or their religion or anything like that. It just had their age, the age of their spouse when they were married. So we, d we simply don't have that information. But what I was saying before is that anecdotally, we know from the from the girls and the women who have reached out to us either to say this is happening to me now please help me or to say this happened to me when i was a child i want to help stop it we know that this is happening in every major religion minor religions and in um secular communities as well and we know that it's happening as i mentioned before at every socioeconomic level and also in both families that have been in the u.s for many generations as well as immigrant families where we have seen their countries of origin are on every inhabited continent mm -hmm. that's just the ones who have reached out to us so uh, so this is a really widespread problem and um and so far in terms of the mail order brides um of the hundreds of survivors we have worked with so and this again just anecdotal but of the hundreds of survivors we have worked with only one so far has been um a, a mail order bride situation where she was brought from russia to the u.s as a mail order bride and she was not a child she was uh, she was an adult she was actually one of our older clients most of our clients are in their um, late teens or early 20s and she was uh, a lot older than that hmm. Um, so can you maybe share with, um, with everyone, um, you know, one or two, I guess, success, uh, success stories that you had or, you know, particular stories that you're proud of, of what Unchained has been able to do? Um, sure. So I, I couldn't, I'm not allowed to share any particular story, obviously, without getting permission. Um, but we do have, uh, you know, some, some clients have agreed to share their story on our website. In fact, I urge everybody to visit unchainedatlast.org. We do have survivor stories there and we're adding additional ones. Um, but um, one of the stories that I like to tell that I have permission to tell, and I um, unfortunately sometimes get emotional when I tell the story, but um, our very first client, her name was Jamie. She had a very a story very similar to my own. She also grew up in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, also had an arranged marriage at 19. Um, 
also turned out to be violent. Um, and she also had two children. And when she reached out to us, you know, she didn't know who I was and she just took a chance. She, she needed help and she just took a chance on me, asked if I could uh, help her when I had just found it unchained at last. And she really needed to get out. And at that point, her, um, her family had also declared her dad refused to help her because she came out. Uh, not only did she leave, but she uh, came out as LGBTQ and her parents, her family just couldn't accept that. And then she was diagnosed with uh, very aggressive breast cancer. And her mother had died of breast cancer, but even then her family would not help her or talk to her at all. So she was a struggling single mom dealing with breast cancer and two kids trying to get divorced from a really abusive guy and, and you know, stuck in a domestic violence shelter with no nowhere to go. And we were really able to not only find her a uh, pro bono divorce attorney to help her, but also, you know, really rebuild her life, get on her own two feet. Um, we even had a funder who bought her a car so that she could get to her cancer treatments. Um, and uh, we were very proud of what we were able to, to do for her, help her get out. Um, she also didn't have, uh, she, she was born in another country, didn't have legal immigration status, and we were able to help her with that as well. And then unfortunately, um, the breast cancer came back and she ended up dying um, a few years ago. But um, so not all the stories have a happy ending. Um, you know, life doesn't have a happy ending, but, um, but at least, you know, she took a chance on us and she was the first one who showed us what, what we can do and, uh, and confirmed for us how important our work was. Hmm. So were you, were you able to help her to get out of that marriage? Um, yes, okay. Yeah, so when she died, she was free on her own with her two children. Um, and she was able to find um, another family to take them in so that they wouldn't be stuck after she died. Well, that is amazing. <laughs> um, okay, so some other questions coming in. Um, so do you have a presence in New York? So I know that you did um, push legislation in New York as well. I don't know if you want to maybe talk about that briefly. Yeah, so I mean, we're located right outside of New York City. So yeah, so uh, most of our clients come from New York and New Jersey. And we um, are uh, with a very strong presence in New York. And in fact, we tend to do a lot of our fundraising events in New York because um, for those of you who have been in this area know people from New Jersey will cross the river into New York for an event, but people from New York absolutely will not cross the Hudson River and come into New Jersey. It's just so, um, yeah, so we do a lot in New York and we did, one of the first bills that we introduced was, again, it was a legislator in New York who called me up and said, I, uh, I, you know, I read about what you're doing. She read an op-ed that I wrote in the New York Times. I'm introducing a bill tomorrow to end child marriage. And so I worked with her to write a really good bill that ultimately failed. And uh, she was surprised by it. And so the next session, she said, because we got such pushback trying to make the marriage age 18, instead I'm going to do what? Florida later did also, which is, I'm going to introduce a bill to make the marriage age 17. And they said, well, that doesn't help anybody. Please don't do that. And she didn't listen, introduced the bill, and it passed. And then Governor Cuomo, when he signed the bill, I didn't even go to the bill signing because I was so upset about this. And he, as I predicted, stood up at the bill signing and announced, I just ended child marriage in New York. Mm. But he did nothing of the sort. And uh, most of the children who marry in New York are 17, and a lot of them are from the Orthodox Jewish community. And I try to explain to this legislator what the marriage night looks like for them, where um, not only are a lot of them forced to have sex, otherwise known as rape, um, but somebody in many of the Hasidic communities, somebody comes over and shaves off all their hair. So under the head covering, they still have to shave off all their hair. If any of you have watched the um, the new Netflix series on Orthodox, which is based on Deborah Feldman's memoir, well, very loosely based. Um, it shows some of that and the memoir talks about some of that. So I tried to explain to the legislator that she's failing to protect these girls, these 17 year old girls who need her help and unfortunately did not get through. But there is now a new bill pending to make the marriage age 18 that, um, maybe could have passed. I don't know, because there was so much pushback from the Orthodox Jewish community to the first bill. So I, it was it was a tough, it was a tough road. But um, with Coronavirus, nothing is happening in Albany now. So sure. So. Yeah, of course. I mean, so there's another question coming in. I get our um, 
participants, I guess, are really interested in knowing more about, um, I guess, what's happening in the Jewish community. So I would say, can you speak broadly, not just the child marriage piece, but even, you know, the other services that you offer just based on your experience with your own clients? Um, you know, how much of those women are coming from the Jewish community as opposed to, you know, different communities? Yeah, so when we first started, most of our clients came from the Orthodox Jewish community because those were the people who were most likely to hear about Unchained at last. Uh, you know, ironically, the rabbis would, in that community, would give us a lot of, um, you know, free advertising because they would make these speeches about this terrible woman who's destroying families and doesn't, you know, you know, doesn't believe in God anymore and it's just so terrible. And so people would leave and they would look me up and they, and they would call and say, I heard the most vile things about you and that's how I know I can trust you. <laughs> so, um, so at first, a lot of our clients, um, like Jamie, were from the Orthodox Jewish community, mostly people who wanted to leave the community. But we've really grown a lot since then. And, and now I would say maybe about a third of our clients come from the Orthodox Jewish community, but it's much more diverse. And I, from the beginning, I wanted it to be diverse because I knew that this was a problem, not only in my former community, but also in a lot of other communities. And the services that we provide, yeah, a lot of it is based on my understanding of the situation just because I have been through it. And, um, but also observing, because there are no two, no two situations exactly the same. So really just observing what, what it is that, that we see with like the trends among our clients. And um, when we first started, I thought that the serv only service we would provide would be finding free legal representation mm -hmm. for, I thought it would be adult women who were already married and trying to escape from a forced marriage. And boy, have we changed since then, because first of all, I realized really early on, the legal representation doesn't help if you're not also providing something as basic as emotional support. And the attorneys were complaining that they couldn't do their job if their clients didn't also have that emotional support and a psychotherapy, because then what would happen is the clients would keep trying to talk to their lawyers as if the lawyers were therapists. And the, ther the lawyers did not like that and felt, um, very put upon and very overwhelmed. And so obviously the emotional support, we realized very early on, that was a crucial piece, even just to support the legal piece. And the psychotherapy was clearly very much needed. But then we also realized so many of our clients who call, they're not you know, separated and looking for a divorce attorney. They're being held against their will or they have not even been married yet. And their plan is or parents are planning a wedding for them and they need to escape. So we added planning these escapes um, as, uh, you know, as some of our services that we provide. And then what we realized is there are a lot of U.S. citizens who are taken overseas for a forced marriage. So when they call us, they're not calling from New York or Chicago. They're calling from Pakistan or, or from Iran. And they're, they're on the phone terrified asking for our help. So we added, you know, international escapes where we develop relationships. At first, we had when we reached out to the State Department to ask for help with this, they thought we were lying or exaggerating or they thought we were crazy. And the very first one I reached out for help, in fact, had a terrible outcome and, and it led to two deaths. Mm. And after that, the State Department started taking us more seriously. And now when we reach out, they, um, they understand what we're talking about and they work with us. And in fact, they will not reach out to us if somebody, walk, a US citizen, walks into an embassy on the other side of the world and says, I was born here against my will to be forced into marriage. Can you help me? Um, and, but then along the way, we also realized that, as I said, no two cases are the same. So we just realized you have to be really creative. And um, some things that we provide, some things we provide for only one client and sometimes we'll provide it and then realize a lot of other clients can benefit from that as well. Like uh, a lot of our clients are brought from overseas for a forced marriage and they need to learn how to, how to speak English as a second language. So just finding classes that they can take. Um, career counseling is something that we realize a lot of our clients need where they said, okay, I want to get a job. But I've never had a job before. I don't know what I want to do. So having them sit with a career counselor who can help them figure out what they might be good at, what they might want to do and help them work on their resume. Mm -hmm. um, getting a GED, a lot of them have, you know, if, if you were married when you were 17 or 16, probably were pulled out of high school. It's 50% more likely that you dropped out of high school if you married as a child. Um, so, you know, just help finishing your education, getting a GED so that you can apply to college, help applying to college. And then a lot of the other thing that we realize a lot of clients need is we help them get into a domestic violence shelter, which is great. And we help them to escape, get into a shelter. Yay. 
done, right? No, because what happens? They have to leave that shelter eventually, and then where are they going to go? So help moving them out of the shelter into their own home. And what we realize is they need everything. So um, we'll, we used to put it, we haven't done this recently, but what we used to do is we would put out, we would send out an email when our email list was much smaller and say, do you have a towel to spare? And we would just ask people for donations. And we've helped survivors set up their entire home, everything from towels to a refrigerator, mm. just yeah. dining room and everything in between, beds, mattresses, linens. Sure. I mean, so that's a lot, right? I mean, so <laughs> Unchained, you're really doing quite a lot for your clients. Um, so I imagine then that you must be working with a lot of other agencies or nonprofits in the community or in, I guess, where the communities where these, um, these clients live to help get them connected to services, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. So for example, domestic violence shelters. I mean, from the beginning, we realized no reason to reinvent the wheel and start our own shelter. There are so, you know, there are great shelters in almost every county of the U.S. There's a domestic violence shelter. Unfortunately, not not enough of them. But, right. um, but so rather than, than open our own shelter, for example, we have developed relationships with domestic violence shelters across the U.S. So we can call and say, hey, there's somebody um, who needs a bed. Is there a bed available? Um, and then, you know, also the, um, there are a lot of large law firms. When we first started doing this, the first thing we wanted to do was provide free legal representation, but we couldn't afford to hire attorneys. So it was a matter of convincing attorneys and begging and pleading. At first it would just, you know, like we did for Jamie, that was the first client we had. And I just, you know, word of mouth, there was a friend who knew a friend who was an attorney who heard her story and said, of course, I'm going to help. And, um, but that's, that's really hard to find, but more and more, we've been able to partner with really large law firms that have offices across the United States who have committed to, to representing unchained clients, law firms like Fruit Frank uh, and DLA Piper. And so, I mean, that's, that's huge for a tiny organization like Unchained at last to have help from those law firms of that size. You know, there's, there was no way we could have done it without these really generous partners and allies. Mm -hmm. And how many clients would you say um, you're, you know, helping at any given time or maybe, you know, on an annual basis? So at any given time, we have, like right now, we have about 65 open client matters. So it's, it's huge. And remember, we have one, we have one staffer who, who you know, who's dedicated. We have one case manager um, who herself is a forced marriage survivor and, um, and she's providing these services to, at any given time, more than 60. And we've had um, we've had up to you know over 100 at a hundred at a at a given time. Mm, that's amazing. So I mean, so before we we kind of conclude our webinar for today, um, you know, what is it that that any of us can do um, for any of our participants? You know, how how can we be helpful um, in supporting your efforts? Well, the the easiest and most important thing that an average person can do. Let's say you can't you know, volunteer for Unchained, you're not a lawyer who can provide your services pro bono or psychotherapist, the, mo the easiest thing that you can do is go online, go to unchainedatlast.org, read about this, um, you know, educate yourself and, and talk about it. If you're on social media, you know, follow us on social media, share, retweet, like. We, our biggest problem is just letting the world know this is happening in the United States. We all know it's happening in developing countries, but we have to recognize that it's happening here also. And then the other really important thing, which all of you are already doing, is we're doing such important work. There's no other organization in the U.S. that's dedicated to doing this work. We can do it on a tight budget, but we do need some resources. So financial support is so important, and I want to thank each and every one of you. Because of your generosity, we are able to combat forced and child marriage in the U.S., and I cannot thank you enough for that. Well, I want to say on, on behalf of uh, the Jewish Women's Foundation, we're so um, happy to be supporting you and um, our trustees just think that you've done such tremendous work, especially, you know, given the size of your staff and your resources. So um, thank you again, you know, for participating in this webinar today. Um, <clears throat> the website again for Unchained at Last is unchainedatlast.org. Um, and thank you for everyone for participating. Uh, we have another webinar next Tuesday at 10 a.m. You can find information about um, our upcoming webinars at our website at jwfpalmbeach.org. So thank you again um, for being here. 
um, just as a reminder that JWF as well is uh, supported by individual donors. And so if you wanted to support our work so that we can help um, provide grants to organizations like Freddy's, um, you can make a donation on our website. So um, thank you so much. Stay uh, healthy and safe. And um, hopefully we will see you next week. Take care. Thanks, Freddy. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.